5.5 million people are licensed to drive on Washington streets. That's a lot of cars, and a lot of people breaking their cars over and over and over again. Every single time any of those 5.5 million people, including you, pushes on the brake pedal, something has to happen to pull our two-ton cars to a stop. That's where the brake pads come in. Modern cars use a disc brake system. This includes a rotor, a caliper, and of course, brake pads. The caliper holds a car's brake pads and pistons close to the rotor, a metal disc that's the centerpiece of each wheel. Of course, your rubber tire goes around this whole thing. So, when I want to stop my car, I hit the brake pedal. This releases hydraulic fluid to activate the caliper system. The fluid drives the caliper's piston forward to press my car's inside brake pad into the rotor, while the other side of the caliper pulls the second brake pad into the rotor. It's like a big clamp. The two brake pads squeeze against the rotor and pull my heavy car to a stop. This generates a lot of friction. And what's going to happen when there's a lot of friction? Well, heat. Friction produces heat in the rotor and brake pads, which is why copper is often used as one of the components in making brake pads. It's great at dissipating the heat that generates when brake pads work against a huge moving vehicle. Now, standard brake pads can contain as much as 25% copper. So imagine this happening over and over and over again. Every time someone hits the brakes, brake pads with copper particles grind against the rotor. Materials wear down, brake pads deteriorate, and copper dust scrapes off. It's sprinkled all over our roadways. Then it rains. Rain falls on the street and washes copper along with lots and lots of other chemicals into Puget Sound. Brake pads result in about 70,000 pounds of copper annually ending up in Puget Sound streams. 70,000 pounds. Now, with that much copper entering Puget Sound, it's inevitable that some will reach young coho salmon. Coho salmon spawn in small coastal streams with year-round water flow. And what's often next to these streams? Well, roads, driveways, parking lots, industries, your neighborhood, my neighborhood, shopping centers, more roads, all of them designed to quickly move stormwater off into drains and pipes that take it away. Away? Often into nearby streams. Roads bring cars, cars bring brake pads, and stormwater runoff brings copper dust into salmon streams. This is your olfactory system. You smell with it. It's called your nose. Well, salmon can smell many, many, many times better than you can. They are very sensitive. Even at low levels, copper harms the olfactory system of salmon, damaging their sense of smell. Now, this is a huge problem because salmon need their sense of smell to find food and stay away from predators in streams. Jan Hasselman, senior attorney with the nonprofit Earth Justice, describes this firsthand after seeing a video of a copper test with juvenile salmon. One salmon was in a clean tank, while the other was in a tank of water with just four parts of copper per billion. Now, let, let's visualize that. It's a very interesting statement. If we had a million grains of rice, we could fill up a medium travel suitcase. But if we had a billion grains of rice, we could fill almost an entire 20-foot shipping container, like the ones you might see on freight ships and large trucks. Four grains of rice in that full shipping container represents four parts per billion. That's a really low amount of copper in the contaminated tank. Washington State University researchers have sampled highway runoff with 60 times as much copper. Now, Hasselman described this story in the fish lab with the tanks. When someone moved their hand over the swim tank in the salmon experiment to simulate a bird coming in to eat the salmon, the salmon in the clean bowl immediately dropped down to the bottom and held rocks still. While the salmon in the contaminated bowl just kept swimming along, the salmon exposed to copper didn't recognize the threat and in the wild would have been promptly gobbled up. And that's just from four parts of copper per billion, a re really small amount. Now, what about the 70,000 pounds of copper that annually end up in Puget Sound streams? If it takes just four parts per billion of copper to affect a salmon's olfactory system, imagine how many juvenile salmon become practically helpless against predators from brake pad pollution. And predators aren't the only added challenge to survival when salmon lose their sense of smell. Tasks like finding food, sensing which stream is their home stream for spawning, and even being able to find a mate become increasingly difficult. Salmon rely on their sense of smell to stay alive and reproduce. So science tells us that we should figure out a way to get rid of copper and brake pads. 
Since 2021, Washington's Better Brakes Law has banned manufacturers from producing brake pads with more than 5% copper. This law also set a goal to make sure all brake pads have less than half a percent of copper by 2025. Now, copper alternatives are far from a radical concept. California has a similar brake law and recognizes the safety of copper-free brake pads. So far, Washington and California are leading the country in their efforts to reduce copper runoff and water sources near roads. Citizens raised the alarm. Scientists investigated the question. Government implemented legislation to address it, took responsibility for managing the contamination, and engaged with industry to make the change. Pretty cool, right? But it takes a long time. Why can't we just swap out the copper? It's hard. There's mechanical engineering and chemistry composition issues to figure out, the realignment of supply chains, manufacturing protocols, safety testing, and more. That's why we want to catch contamination issues early, like with copper and brake pads. The issue was brought to the table by local champions for salmon health. A new law was passed, and then over a decade later, copper is being phased out of brake pads. It's working, and it could happen again with all the other complex chemicals of concern in our waterways. Assuming we know what the pollutant is, it all starts with identifying the problem.